Our next movie is Friday the 13th, the final chapter, an immoral and reprehensible piece of trash that sold more tickets on its opening weekend than any other movie so far in 1984. And that is a very, very depressing commentary. It really makes me sad to think of all those moviegoers spending four and a half, five bucks, most of them teenage kids, sitting there watching this sad, cynical, depressing movie. Now, Jason, you can't hear him, you can't see him, he hardly even breathes. He's the latest word in leading men from the geniuses at Paramount Pictures. You get the idea. Friday the 13th, the final chapter, is 90 minutes of teenagers being strangled, stabbed, impaled, chopped up, and mutilated. That's all this movie is, is just mindless, bloody violence. And just think of the message this film offers to its teenage audience. The world is a totally evil place, this movie says. It'll kill you. It doesn't matter what your dreams and hopes and ambitions are. It doesn't matter if you have a new boyfriend or a new girlfriend or you've got plans for the future. You can forget those plans because you're going to wind up dead. There is literally nothing else in this movie. And the sickest thing is, this isn't the final chapter. That's just an advertising gimmick. The ending clearly sets up a sequel. And what I want to know is, I wonder if they're going to be heartless and cynical enough to make the sequel, because why not? They've already taken the bucket to the cesspool four times for the sludge. I think the people who made this, who made this movie ought to be ashamed of themselves, and that's what I think, Gene. No. And I'm going to vote no. <laughs> I had a feeling you might. Roger and I, not long ago, reviewed a pretty rough thriller named uh, Nightmare on Elm Street 3, a violent, mad slasher movie that throws in a sex scene out of the blue as a young boy is teased and then tied up by a devil masquerading as a nurse. <laughs> is rough stuff. Now, there was absolutely no controversy about the rating of A Nightmare on Elm Street 3. It received an R rating probably out of hand. It may be raunchy, but that's the way most teenage horror films are, and the Raiders went right along with that. Me feel unclean and disturbed as I was watching it, and I can only imagine what effect it might have on small children. As a film critic, I have to say this movie is well made and effective, but as a human being, I wish I hadn't seen it. What good can come of having such foul and ugly images pumped into your mind? I think that my um, heart and and mine may be closer connected than yours. I, I don't make too much of a distinction. Um, I, I thought that uh, I was laughing at the film because it was so preposterous um, when they have that little doll uh, attacking with a knife. At the same time, it's sickening. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't think that the filmmaking was pretty good. I, I'll, the only thing I'll grant you is the, 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 the final fight in the, in the toy factory the toy is factory. well staged yes, because you have all the boxes and that's and that's And the assembly engaging. line and all that's the other I, stuff. Okay, yes. that, that part. But that's the, that's the end of the picture. Uh, all of the other setup involving the doll is, is, is really silly and again, I must well, stress, and I must sh stress how violently abusive the doll is, and how uh, sickening the, the, the role of the, an actual child had to see, play opposite. Even then, you're contradicting yourself because if it's silly, then it wouldn't be violently abusive. It's more than silly, Gene. Oh no, it's really sick. That I have a knee-jerk response to showing children in jeopardy, and it is it is cheap. It is rarely justified, and in this piece of trash, it's not justified Well, my at only all. point would be that the movie is even worse because it's so well made. You have to grant it. It's well made. and that's Only, one only the in the last like. sequence. The building where they own a condo is trashed in a movie like this. I hope they got free tickets. I hope they didn't. Now, I said you couldn't sit through this movie if you had any common sense. Well, why not? Well, because the following things take place inside the Hancock building. Whole apartments become filled with snow and ice. Corridors are filled with steam. The parking garage and the swimming pool freeze over. Several cars explode and turn the garage into a roaring inferno. You saw the bottomless pit. The sprinkler system floods the place. The elevators race up and down like yo-yos. Windows are broken, and yet at no point do any policeman or any fireman ever turn up, nor does any of this ever make the papers. Amazing. In fact, nobody seems to notice How about it. repairs? Exactly. The screenplay for this movie is also amazing because it makes a serious tactical error. It uses too many scenes in which the characters incessantly cry out for oh, each other. Yes. Carol Ann! Carol Ann! Bruce! Bruce! Patricia! Patricia! Carol Ann! Bruce! 
finally, the, the night that I saw it, even the audience was joining in. Carol Ann! Carol Ann! Bruce! I mean, you I must it. have heard the you name Carol Ann yes. a thousand times. Now, I'm disappointed. I'm, I'm pleased that you... We're getting into the dynamic of this show. I'm pleased <laughs> that you were smart enough to pick up on Carol Ann. Thank you very but much. But I was hoping that you wouldn't, because I was all going to do my Carol Ann imitations. Oh, good. And so well, I have to That will be denied Because that. I was saying there... I wonder how many times the name Carol Ann is said in this movie. My guess, you guess, just in a second, think, 100? 100? A hundred times and, 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 I heard the name up Carol Ann. Up and down Carol the staircase. Ann. Carol Ann. Uh, the scene, goes up. Carol, Carol Ann, Ann, Carol Ann, Carol Ann, as he goes Carol up. Carol Ann. Then behind him is, is uh, Nancy Allen, his, his uh, wife. Bruce, 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 but as she look, goes up. Characters in this movie, by the way, they're named Kirsty and Tiffany. <laughs> I love them because this is another one of those movies where they say the names way too often, over and over again. Kirsty, Tiffany, Tiffany, Kirsty, Kirsty, dee dee, Tiffany, over and over, just until the audience is almost tempted to start shouting Tiffany and Kirsty back at the screen, if only to break the monotony. Or to the continue it. Or to continue the monotony. <laughs> Good point. The problem here is that there is no discernible beginning middle or end to this nightmare, just a series of disconnected and gruesome scenes. It's the kind of film where the theater doesn't need to print the running times. They don't have to put that in the newspaper because you can walk in anywhere and have more or less the same experience. The technical credits are good, but I really think they should have gone to the trouble of providing us with the story. I want to focus on one word that you mentioned, which is gruesome. I mean, this film could be actually titled Skinned Alive. I mean, you see enough blood and uh, bare skin or uh, the sub-layer of skin uh, to then, uh, you know, in a butcher shop. I mean, it's uh, fairly repellent as uh, these kinds of things go. We're sort of neared to it. We see this stuff all the time, but at the same time, uh, buckets it of blood. Does, it, it, just it does doesn't. set some kind of a record. You know, images like this in medieval times uh, were the stuff of uh, Hieronymus Bosch paintings, and people were absolutely horrified. Now it's just fodder for public entertainment, and kids go in and look at people flayed alive and dripping their organs all over the place, and they just laugh at it. Nothing seems, no images seem to have any power anymore. No, well made. That scene was well made. But what is this movie saying? That older man tortures that boy all through the movie. He plays tricks on him, he tries to kill him, he frames him for murder, he kills his girlfriend. He completely takes charge of that young boy's life. He is evil personified. And at the end of the movie, what happens? Something very sick happens. There is the unmistakable implication that that kid sort of liked that treatment and that he might become the next hitcher. Later in the show, we have a movie named Nine and a Half Weeks that's gotten a lot of publicity for its story of kinky sex. But if you look beneath the surface of the hitcher, this movie is ten times more perverted, more heartless, and more cruel. It's a deeply cynical movie that doesn't even have the courage to admit what it's really about, which is gay sadomasochism. And I don't know which I hated more in this movie, the cynicism or the dishonesty. Well, Roger, I can't quantify the hatred I have for this movie, but I'm going to try. Okay. <laughs> because I get paid to do that. Um, very early on, and we saw that first scene, the dismemberment scene. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the hook. We're supposed to now get interested. This is guy's tough. Mm -hmm. We didn't need the explicit. I, I didn't even like the language use of this dismemberment. That's how short my fuse has become on violence when I see it in service of something that is nothing more than violence. Mm -hmm. This film is nothing more than a dozen ways to chop up a person. That's really all it's about. Now, I picked that throwing up scene, not to gross anybody out, but to make a point of how offensive this movie really is. Someone connected with this film decided that that scene needed the throwing up, that it wasn't horrible enough without the barfing, and that person or persons was dead wrong. The mood was already set. You didn't need the extra shot. The music told you what was going on, but my suspicion is that that scene was included because they knew they didn't have a good script here in this picture, and they needed to spice it up with some shocking scenes and it's for that extra bit of sickening material, and there's lots of it in this picture. That's the reason that Amityville 2, The Possession, makes my list as one of the worst films of the year. And you know, one of the films I'm looking forward to seeing least in 1983 is a movie that's going to be called Amityville 3D, in which they're yeah. probably going to throw up on the audience. It'll probably be called Amityville 3, the sub-lease or something. <laughs> because Romero has pulled out all the stops and turned Day of the Dead into a real bloody, gory geek show where things like cannibalism, disembowelment, and evisceration are pretty much routine, everyday sorts of things. The movie alternates those gruesome scenes with a very talkative plot in which the angry military man makes endless threatening speeches against the civilians until eventually, of course, it's free lunchtime for the ghouls. I thought this movie was a real disappointment, especially after Dawn of the Dead, which I admired very much. It lacks the high energy and the ruthless anarchy of that earlier movie, and it gets bogged down 
and a lot of overacted speech making and recycled special effects. Well, I couldn't agree with you more. This is an awful film, actually. I think uh, the Dawn of the Dead was the one set in the shopping center and yeah. had a lot of comments on the shopping mall as a very era death-like place and kind of creepy. In this, this movie, they say all the shopping malls are closed. Right. So we have this yeah, one so set movie. One set it. movie in a basement, right. which is really exciting. Uh, comment on basements, I suppose. <laughs> uh, actually, this film is like a trip to a rendering factory. I mean, this is, or a, a bad butcher shop. That's all you see is just blood and guts being thrown across the floor of the uh, garage or wherever they shot this picture. And there's... This movie is so badly made that the death of the shark isn't even set up well. There's a key shot missing so that we don't even get the whole picture. We walk out of the theater very frustrated. And that last scene is preceded by one of the most glaring errors in recent movie history. Michael Caine has been in the water, has swum to safety onto the boat, but in the very next scene, his shirt is as dry as if it had just been freshly laundered. Let's hope this is the end of the Jaws series. The first film was thrilling and well acted. The rest have been trash. It's not even the next shot. Michael Caine actually comes over the rail out of the water right. and he's totally dry. I, I was know. sitting in the theater and I said, his shirt is dry. I you know, know. The preview audience uh, Laugh. appreciated that. You know, I always hate it when people talk during the movies, but I don't know. That seemed to go over pretty well. Yeah. You know, I got a question for you. Go I may ahead. be very badly confused here. In this, I you, you know usually am. In this movie, yeah. this shark wants revenge against the Brody family. You got it. Yes. Okay. Now, in the first movie, what happened to the shark in the first movie? Dead. Blow into pieces, right? Yeah. What happened to the shark in the second movie? I know, dead. You're yeah, right. Uh -huh. What happened to the shark in they the third movie? They all die. They all die. So in that case, Their family. what shark is this? Friday the 13th Part 2 is a disheartening and depressing movie because it contains an absolutely negative view of human nature. It's just a series of teenagers who come on screen, mm -hmm. say a few words, and then they're hacked to pieces. Mm -hmm. Among the movie's low points is a kid in a wheelchair who has his head hacked open by a machete and a young couple who are both impaled by the same spear. This isn't a movie, it's a cinematic geek show. It seems to be made by and for people with no cheerfulness, no hope, no trust in human nature. I think that's well said. And uh, I can only add that, yeah, when the machete went into the head of the kid in the wheelchair, mm -hmm. that's about when I gave up on the picture. Uh, depressing is the, the key word in this discussion. Because I think some people say, oh, they're just picking on that same old thing again. And yeah. what I'm saying is no. I'm only picking on films, horror films, that are depressing. Mm -hmm. Not exhilarating, depressing. It's the same movie, shot after shot, and it's depressing. I, I walked into the theater, I sat there, I thought, gee, the first one made so much money, maybe for part two they decided to spend a little money, spend a little talent, have a little imagination. The movie is so cynical. It's simply a series of mutilations and murders. This movie yeah. is made by people who hate movie audiences. Well, the other thing that I can...